Hi there. So today I'm going to do something a little bit different than what I've done in my other video podcasts, of which there are 10, which is kind of cool. I'm trying to do as many as I can, at least one a week, maybe more than that. Um, while I have done those uh, video podcasts, I think in maybe half of them I've mentioned the Arbinger Institute. Um, I am not an employee of Arbinger. I, I they're not sanctioning what I'm going to be saying about them or what I have said about them. Um, I just simply review, if you will, and have opinions about what they do, and I think it's very valuable to humankind, but certainly also in the treatment world. Terry Warner wrote a book that became sort of the um, seminal work, the, the basis uh, um, upon which Arbinger is um, built and started out as a manuscript quite a while ago in the 80s actually um, in 1990 I became familiar with it at the time it was a, a manuscript it was called Bonds of Anguish Bonds of Love and I read pieces of it sitting by a river on a rock uh, uh, with kids around a campfire uh, had quite, an, quite, a, quite a sort of um, intimate, um, genuine experience, kiddos, in wilderness settings, reading this, this manuscript. Uh, it became an actual book, uh, oh gosh, 2000-ish, 2001, 2, 3, something along those lines. Um, and it's called Bonds That Make Us Free. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a, a review, so to speak of the book or actually just part of it just the very beginning um, and I'll, I'll see if I go on to other uh, chapters um, probably will but I wanted to cover just the preface the preface is sort of a, 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 a summary uh, of the book um, but it's definitely sort of an explanation of it the preface is fascinating to me because it is very dense. It holds a lot of information. And so I'm going to see if I can cover it uh, as well as I can and uh, go from there. So I have it here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to follow along, or you can follow along if you have it. But anyway, I'm going to read and follow along with the preface um, and then throw in my, my two cents, uh, my opinions. Uh, it, and I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll try to indicate that I'm reading rather than saying quote unquote quote unquote you kind of see me staring at the phone it's probably because I'm reading so here we go preface people can change fundamentally in their hearts and not just in their outward behavior right out of the gates sentence number one people can change fundamentally well, there, it, it, it's interesting because there's actually a couple pretty major points in there. What does change mean? And what does fundamentally mean? And what does uh, not just in their outward behavior mean? Um, oh, to fundamentally change, to be one sort of person and then to be completely a different sort of person, especially in particular aspects of one's life. Um, I believe it's possible. I believe that when we work with adolescents in the wilderness and when anybody attempts to work with other people, those people will make changes and they are, uh, are, are in a lot of instances, those people make changes that are fundamental. They're com they are completely different people. People who, it's as if they never had the particular struggles that they had. Um, there is a sort of an idea out there that what we need to do to help people is to get them to um, cope better and make some behavioral changes to sort of organize their life in such a way that they are functioning notwithstanding the difficulties that they're experiencing in their heart towards others and pain and anguish and anger and all of that. But his theory is, no, people can change fundamentally. Um, from their, the deepest part of themselves, as if their past or the past of others that have interacted with them didn't exist. And not just in their outward behavior. Okay, so outward behavior, let's talk about that. Can I, um, 
can I act in certain ways and uh, be disingenuous about it? Sure, everybody knows that. In fact, most of us get a sense of that if we encounter somebody who's acting in certain ways and is disingenuous about it. And usually, if it's just an outward behavior type thing, it's because the external parameters have pressed down so much on that particular person that they decided I'm going to chain, change certain aspects of my behavior. Um, what happens in instances like that is you have, say, somebody who, who's dealing with addiction. Well, there's reasons why they deal with addiction. Maybe there's trauma in their life. There's a lot of different reasons. Well, if they change their outward behavior, meaning they stop doing a particular substance, that's awesome, by the way. But are the underlying, have they changed fundamentally in terms of what sort of led to the addiction of substances in the first place? And if they haven't, what other kinds of things do they do that, uh, that uh, are still damaging in their life? Uh, they're not they're not drinking, they're not doing drugs, and that's great. Uh, have they replaced that with another kind of addiction? Um, has nicotine or sexual addiction come into the, in, into the fore now? Or gaming addiction, or computer addiction, other kinds of process addictions that perhaps are far less damaging, but are still, it's the, 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 the issues are still there. So Terry is um, putting out there that People can change inside themselves fundamentally, which, by the way, then that is what contributes to their change in behavior. We don't go to the beha addressing the behavior first. Hey, let's address this behavior, um, and then what under un, what what was under it kind of continues. A version of that behavior is going to come back. Um, but if we're seeking to maybe deal with outward behavior some as well. But um, to, for a fundamental change, then uh, the ba behavior will correct itself over time if we've made that change. So that's sentence number one. Let's go to number two. I have been led to this conviction partly as a result of having lived through the transformation experiences of many individuals. I say lived through because I had very little do, I had very little to do with the change they made. Well, there's another whammy. Um, so Terry's a, a doctor of philosophy and has helped a lot of people in a myriad uh, of ways <clears throat> uh, in the psychology field, in the helping sciences field. Uh, he's done a lot of work there. He, he has been, he has lived through helping, oh my gosh, thousands of people. Um, but he calls it lived through because he had very little to do with the change they made. Wow. So there's a term called change agent. Some people believe that if a person changes, they made that change. They themselves are the change agent. And all of the therapeutic interventions are pointed towards helping that person be empowered to be the entity that changes or it finds his or her or their own healing and that they do it others are you know kind of hung up they may take a lot of ownership in being the therapist that's that that healed this person or that participated so deeply in the progress of this person it was kind of them too you know yeah yeah it's kind of me too i'm a healer i'm the kind of person who uh, can really transform lives uh, that is about the person who is thinking themselves of themselves as the healer, by the way. It's not the people that they're helping. And if you help in that way, the people that you help, in my opinion, will also kind of have this tinge of a feeling that uh, perhaps they couldn't have done it by themselves. Perhaps it was because of you that they were able to change. And that's a dangerous place for them to be in. So... The fact that he, again, we're not even past the first paragraph, right out of the gates, claims, I had very little to do with the change they made, I think is profound and simple and beautiful. We can be powerful influences, 
in people's lives, granted. But a person doesn't change unless they want to. It can't be changed against their will. If we're talking about internal things, they could, their behavior can be changed against their will. That happens all the time. Viktor Frankl attests to that concept all the time. But he also says you can't... This is the Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. If you've never read it, look it up, read it. It's amazing as well. I might talk about that book later. Um, he made it clear to everybody that although your behavior can be absolutely changed by somebody else, i.e. the Nazis and the people that they oppressed and killed, um, but they can't control what goes on inside of you. And he figured that out and wrote a whole book about it. So I had very little to do with the change they made. They brought it about themselves. That's what has delighted me about the work I have been privileged to participate in. The possibility of overcoming very deep personal and interpersonal problems lies within the power of each of us. In my experience, in my opinion, to the degree one believes that sentence is the degree to which one actually can overcome their deep personal and interpersonal problems. If they uh, don't believe that it, it, it is within their power, um, they won't do it. They, they may won't, maybe won't even be able to do it. If they believe it's within their power, and people have, you know, a helping professional or a, or a friend or a mentor or a coach has helped illuminate to them that they have the power, and they believe it, and they start to move down this this road of healing because of believing in that sentence. That's that that's the role of somebody who's trying to help somebody else is to help them understand that they have the power, um, and they can access it. So that was the first short paragraph not many people believe this most are convinced that our genetic structure and life experiences have dictated the kind of people we have become hence any changes we might make will be behavioral not emotional and attitudinal even those self-help programs that paint seductive pictures of a transformed life generally turn out when studied closely to focus more on outward rather than inward change so, again, he, he draws this distinction between outward chain, change and this change that happens inside. And self-help uh, programs or you know, all kinds of programs can be pointed towards that, 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 that behavioral stuff. His material and his work has been all about addressing way of being or addressing one's heart, one's, one's insides. Um, and he points out that not many people believe this, which is true. That's why his work is so important. That's why the work of Arbinger is so, so important and, and uh, people like them to help us all understand that it's true. It, we can fundamentally change and it needs to start from inside and go out. And it's not dictated on our genetic structure our experiences in our life. There's a lot of that that compounds problems, maybe, or where, where uh, it might be slightly more difficult for some people to navigate their experiences than other people for theirs because of the difficulty that they've had um, or some genetics that are in there. But this paragraph says we can cut through all of that. Any of us have the ability to cut through that. Um, if we choose to. I'm not going to read everything. I've made some notes and, and uh, uh, am, am just choosing particular snippets out of the preface, so I've skipped ahead a little bit. Here we go again. The answer to this extraordinarily challenging and fascinating question is that we devise and hang on to our emotional problems for a purpose, a purpose more important to us than our happiness. What? So now he's getting into this concept that, well, people don't believe that you can actually change. Well, then what he's saying here is, well, can they? And how do they do it? Um, well, part of answering that question is uh, exploring this, um, this concept that 
if we're experiencing a problem that's painful, well, we're, keep, we're holding on to it for a reason, for a purpose that we find is more important than not having it, more important than our happiness, more important than our positive relationships. There's something about it that's more important to us to hold on to whatever that, that thing is that's causing us pain. Um, read the whole book and it won't sound as strange as I just sort of made it possibly sound. And we deceive ourselves about the fact that this is what we're doing. This is sort of the crux of the work that uh, Terry Warner does and that Arbinger does. It help us recognize the fact that we are in what's called self-deception by means of self-betrayal. So when we're stuck in our problems and we believe we can't get out of them, especially having problems having to do with interpersonal uh, stuff, which constitutes most of the emotional problems that people have, even mental health problems, um, is that uh, we hold that to be more important, but we don't know it at the time while we're in, in the scenario because we're self-deceived because over time we've made the problem more important, experiencing the problem more important to us than living happy because it justifies things. Okay, we participate in the creation of our emotional troubles and deny we've had any part of it. In regard to our troubling emotions and attitudes, we are on our own, we are our own worst enemies. Hmm. All right, I'm going to skip ahead. As solutions to the theoretical problems gradually became clear, we were led to develop a method of teaching that emboldened people to see their own lives clearly and honestly. What I skipped ahead of is Terry got together with other people and they really explored this concept of self-betrayal and self-deception with, with, with folks who are embedded deeply in the world of philosophy and psychology and the pursuit of understanding human nature and why we do what we do for many, many years. And, uh, but, but exploring almost exclusively this idea of self-betrayal, which is going against a sense we have to do towards somebody. We have a sense to do something for somebody and we, we don't do it. What we've done is we've gone against our very own conscious. Or if we have a sense not to do something and we do it anyway, we've gone against our very own uh, ability to have a sense. We've gone against our own self. Do that enough and... Uh, we live in a situation wherein yeah, we got to somehow explain to ourselves or make it okay to ourself that uh, what I did was, well, maybe it was wrong, but it was justified. And it's part of self-deception is you walk around feeling justified that you've done, that, that, that um, maybe that's not okay, that what, what you've done, but it's certainly probably not your fault um, and therefore probably okay. Uh, or that you were stuck in your doing of it. Um, a lot of justification, a lot of excuses come out of this. But what he's saying is that they developed a, a way of teaching people about self-betrayal and self-deception uh, that emboldened them to see their own lives more clearly. Um, I've, I've taught the Arbinger Seminar, like the basic Arbinger Seminar, I don't uh, maybe a couple hundred times. And every time that I that I teach this material to other people, my walk away is, oh my gosh, they're, 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 I recognize a little bit more of, of you know, the, how I justify myself. You know, I think people are like uh, fields um, where things are planted, you know. So imagine a, a wheat field, let's say, or a big plot of land, and somebody wants to grow wheat there. Um, and by the way, if you drive into Idaho, you notice these big stack of rocks in the corners of fields or between fields and strategic places. And, um, what happens is you got to plow that field and up come big rocks. And so you stack them off in a corner. You've made some progress. You plant your wheat. You, you do what you do. And the next season, well, you got to plow the field and what the heck, up come more rocks. I thought I just did this. And the next year, up more rocks, up more rocks, up more rocks. There probably is no end to pulling up rocks that need to go, you know, need to be put over uh, on on the rock pile. But the rocks have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You got rid of the big rocks, 
sort of in that first pass, but they're still there. Um, there's still more to do. There's still more progress to make. All of us can still, at any point, seek to see our lives more clearly and more honestly. They put together um, an information packaged in such a way so that people can kind of walk through that. A, a way to so just see themselves more clearly. Um, and it happened for me the first time I went to Arbinger Seminar and the first time I, I encountered um, the, 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 the little, you know, bonds of anguish, bonds of love sort of manuscript thing and started to learn about this. Uh, it, it, most people can experience a moment of honesty. Uh, but sometimes it it is it's it's nice that there are special circumstances that allow us to just have that moment of honesty, and this information for me has been that moment, helping me have that moment. All right, to our amazement, we found right from the first that almost all of the participants in our classes experienced in small degree or great something of a fundamental change, a change of heart. What? Um, now, like I said, I've taught the Arbinger's material a lot, you know, many, many times over about 25 years and, and over 30 years if you count teaching it to adolescents out in the desert places. And um, I have found this to be true as well. It's probably a bell curve like most things, you know. Some people, it doesn't affect them too much. It's almost an annoyance that they're having to be honest with themselves and other people like, wow, this was really amazing. It, you know, it helped me see, you know, things more clearly. And then over on this end of the bell curve, my entire life has changed forever. I'm a new person. I've seen all of those um, different scenarios with people encountering the Arbinger material. Um, I think I have been all three of those <laughs> types of people over the years. Um, I would like to think that I've been over on this side of the bell curve at, at least a couple times. Um, but up in the main part of it, up in the main part of the bell curve, it has, it really does affect people in positive ways just to, just to learn about the material. Um, just to see it put together in such a way that I have an opportunity to just see things a little bit more honestly how I relate to others, how I see others. All right. Um, moving on. I have tried to write this book in the spirit of the Arbinger classes, the ones that I just talked about. I have described partly by including a number of the many rich stories that individuals have shared over the course of nearly a quarter of a century. If you ponder them, these true stories are likely to serve you better than the explanations that connect them. And this is true too. Uh, a lot of storytelling happens in uh, delivering this information uh, that Arbinger has to offer. Um, mostly because it's in the actual real experience of people shared with others where we as people um, can get a sense of how it personally happened for someone, how they personally felt. And if they went through this experience, maybe that's more possible for me. So stories are important. Um, and and he, there's a lot of stories in this in the book, Bonds That Make Us Free. If you go to an Arbinger seminar, whoever presents it is going to have a series of stories, hopefully quite a few about themselves, um, in terms of how they have, you know, not seen people as people and then times when they have seen people as people or times when they have gotten out of the box with people maybe on a different podcast uh i will share one of my major getting out of the box stories um but for now i'm going to continue reading parts of this preface i should add a word about the explanations that surround the stories they make this book different from other works on similar topics as people gain a deep true understanding of their attitudes and actions, their self-deceptions fade, and they can begin to see clearly how to move forward on their own. So 
that's what makes their stories actually even more powerful as, as well. If I'm living in self-deception here and then boom, I'm not in self-deception anymore. I look back on that and seeing it, seeing it in a completely new way. And I tell that story. Um, and it's a powerful thing uh, to, to have one's self-deception fade such that you see your past and how you interpret things in, in new ways. And then you can teach people about it. Okay, um, moving on. My heart goes out to two kinds of readers, both of whom may have particular difficulty coming to grips with what I will say. First are those who want to deal with the material intellectually um, as a way of muffling their own inner voice. Um, I think a lot of things can be handled intellectually. I think religion can be handled intellectually. I think good ideas in terms of the human sciences can be dealt with intellectually as opposed to in practice. Um, I speak a lot about Taoism. Uh, it, that can just be a scholarly exercise as well, an academic exercise. Um, uh, definitely an intellectual exercise. Um, that would be not only wasting time, uh, it would also be an example of somebody being a self-deception. I'm smart enough to understand this. And perhaps I'm smarter than other people because I really get into this stuff. And I notice when people are in this place of self-deception, I'm good at noticing people when they're self-deceived how they became self-deceived, how entire societies are self-deceived. I'm really good at this. So if you want to gain wisdom at my feet, uh, just, you know, let me know. That's what we're talking about. You know, this is an intellectual exercise. Um, the most profound things come from the most simple oh, beginnings or from the most simple places, unless you're talking about you know science or whatever, uh, hard sciences. But in terms of human nature, we can make it super complicated because we're making it an exercise in intellectualism, or we can think, you know what? Um, I also need to change, and what about me changing helps me recognize ways that I perhaps can help people or ways that I can understand the material coming from my heart. There is a, a concept in Taoism that basically says um, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao. The Tao that can be defined isn't, isn't the true Tao. The Tao that, can, that it is spoken too much about isn't the true Tao. Um, if you try to complicate it too much, you're getting away from it, whatever it is. It is to be experienced. If I, um, if I, if I um, have never tasted salt, somebody could intellectually try to describe to me how the molecule of of uh, salt upon meeting the tongue uh, gives this or that sort of effect. I would never get it. And they wouldn't be able to explain it well enough. But boy, howdy, they'd have, they'd have a lot of fun um, trying to ex to explain it in some kind of complicated way. Or I can, you know, just take a grain of salt. Okay, I get it. I get it. All right. So the second type of person that he gives uh, warning to, the other readers for whom I am concerned suffer from feelings of deep inadequacy. So he, he gives a bit of a description here that to explore the book, Bonds That Make Us Free, one could sort of fall into despair. Oh my gosh, I have been such a self-deceiving person. I've seen people as objects. I'm a piece of trash. Um, how can I augment the guilt that I feel more than how I currently feel it? How can I really crank this up and really, you know, struggle here? That's not the point of the book at all. It's, it's actually the complete opposite of that. 
Um, it is its own self-deception to think that I, as a person, need to continue to feel guilt-ridden and shamed, whether I believe that I'm putting that shame on myself or being shamed by others. Um, that is its own its own problem. The 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 bulk of the book is an invitation for us to see ourselves more clearly, including that we are human like other humans, and that we have compounded in our own mind our inadequacies in such a way where we have uh, left ourselves um, um, bereft of having to be responsible for anything. You know, it's it's more important to us to be holding on to shame and guilt and and um, sort of um, uh, uh, negative uh, need to be seen as uh, self-deprecating sorts of concepts. And so the book, the book um, brings that to light and helps people work on that too. Okay, moving on. No self-proclaimed human authority will serve you better than your own straightforward sense of what is right. It's a loaded sentence. Some people have a hard time with the concept that there is right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about right and wrong. Um, and I literally hope I don't offend anybody out there. Um, in my opinion, there absolutely is right and wrong. Now, what I mean by that is I might not have a complete handle on everything that's right and everything that's wrong. I don't think... The definition of what's right or wrong uh, is laid out in a particular religious text for the clarity of all humankind. I don't believe that a group of people can ha command the right and now know what to deliver to the rest of humanity so that they now have the right as well, or that they can claim that other people are wrong. I have, I'm, I'm not claiming that people can know other people's right and wrong, but I am... Uh, 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 claiming and, and understand and agree with the material that one has one's own sense of right and wrong. I have a sense to call my grandmother just to talk. I just, it just occurs to me to do that. It's the right thing to do. If I don't do it, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> uh, it's as simple as that. I, when when I go against me, um, that's where I start running into these problems. So I'm going to repeat that one. No self-proclaimed human authority will serve you better than your own straightforward sense of what is right. So Terry in this book describes the concept of kind of what I just described, right and wrong. I have a sense to do, I have a, I have a sense towards others and I do it. Right. If I have a sense not to do something, I do it anyway. Wrong. And if I have a sense to do something for somebody, I don't do it wrong. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't um, shrink back from using uh, the concepts and the words and the ideas of right and wrong. Um, I, I made my own version of the Tao Te Ching. And very early translations of the Tao Te Ching talk about uh, this idea that there is a right and wrong. In fact, there's one particular, and I'll, that'll be its own episode, by the way, where Lao Tzu says, you know, some people say there is no right and wrong. Right flows into wrong, and wrong is a place from whence right effervesces, and, or some kind of concept like that. But then he adds, how inane a concept that is very well articulated in older translations of the Tao Te Ching from Chinese to English. That he makes this, this point, you know, some people say there is no right and wrong, but then he adds, how inane a concept. Newer translations, maybe in the last 20 years of the Tao Te Ching, don't add that second part. They just keep it that the Tao Te Ching itself says, there's no right and no wrong. That is baloney. The Tao Te Ching does not say that. does not claim that there is no right and no wrong. To follow the way, to follow the Tao, to try to live in line with the Tao, one could say the words is right. To not live one's life 
according to the Tao, to not even try, one could say, is wrong. Um, I can follow the red road or the black road in Lakota speak. I can walk forward, I can walk backward in Navajo speak. I can um, uh, live a life of honor or dishonor in other cultures speak. Uh, there are a lot of variations on this theme and words that kind of can describe it, um, but it's an internal process. And our sense of right um, will lead us down the road a lot farther than trying to get a sense of some authority figure telling us what we ought to do. That's what he was trying to say. At least that's what I think. Okay. Uh, the, the last sentence in uh, the preface. It would not be accurate to describe this book as supplying the truths upon which we must build our lives. Instead, it shows how we can put ourselves in that receptive, honest, and discerning condition that will en enable us, any of us, to find these truths on our own. So a person writes a whole book. The entire book is just a pointer. It's just a compass, perhaps, to help people find the truth that they need. It's not saying this book is, the, is, is what will lend you the truths that you need to hear. But it will help you discover the truths on your own. And by the way, there is no other way to learn them. There's no way to learn the truths one, need, one needs to know when it comes to one's emotional, mental health, relationship health, um, uh, uh, level of self-deception or not. We're the only ones that can. You can't put that in somebody. And I, I, love, uh, I love being in the wilderness and being around a fire and describing principles and exploring principles with kiddos around the fire and everybody just kind of kind of maybe riffing a little bit you know hey well this is how it applies to me oh you know what i can totally see that principles just become explored and then the lights start going on inside the person's mind and heart so true learning is what happens between people it's not conveyed like this, it happens between people. True learning. And I believe that the book Bonds That Make Us Free helps people uh, arrive at true learning because it helps them change the relationships between them and everybody else. So that was the preface. Um, make some comments in, in, in this uh video podcast if you want me to summarize or go over more of this book i will wait for that um and not from all those people that uh you know that i know you know if somebody out there wants to know more about this book or wants to hear more of a um uh, like a, a full book review which would take probably 10 podcasts then let me know in the comments. Um, look for other episodes. I'm trying to crank them out. Um, I, again, I have two sort of veins that I'm going on. Sort of what I want to talk about, <laughs> which was today, which will have its own you know track, if you all want that, in terms of reviewing the book. And the other one is doing episodes of my book, um, uh, some episodes which will be made public to everybody and I haven't quite decided how I'm going to deliver the rest of the 81 because that had that'll have 81 podcasts uh, or video podcasts because the Dao Te Ching has 81 uh, sections um, okay great so uh, thank you very much and everybody have a great day week month um, and get a hold of this book Bonds That Make Us Free by C. Terry Warner. See you later.